Muchachos y muchachas. A lot of people have had their suspicions about the music industry, but especially the hip hop industry. And recently there have been multiple lawsuits that would surface a lot of these allegations or these suspicions up to the limelight, including those that are against Sean P. Diddy Combs. Recently, there was one lawsuit that just onset the rest of this, and that was with Cassie Ventura, and then onward, many others came forward against P. Diddy. Well, there is a recent lawsuit filed by Rodney Jones, AKA Lil Rod, against P. Diddy that has us all scratching our head. I already did a part one video covering some allegations made by Lil Rod, but this is going to be the part two where we'll really hit the home run and go through the rest of these details. Everything from, you know, associates, business associates and leadership uh, under Sean P. Diddy Combs enterprise enabling his behavior and enabling illegal behavior, things like this. We're going to take a deeper dive into this and we will see what is being alleged. With that being said, hold on to your butts, secure your wigs, stay right there. We're going to go through it. All right, I've been hearing you and your feedback. I'm going to just try to be less censorious in this video. So we'll test it out. We'll see how the system responds to me, but let's take a look into these next forward allegations by Lil Rod. If you missed part one of this video series, go back to part one, watch that first if you want a holistic and complete overview of this lawsuit. All right, let's jump into it. So the next part of the lawsuit alleges that about July 2nd, 2023 in California, Sean P. Diddy Combs had a listening party at his home. It says that the event began at 7 p.m. and Mr. Sean P. Diddy Combs requested female sex workers and were required by Rodney Jones, the filer of this lawsuit, to solicit them. An hour later, several sex workers appeared. In addition to sex workers, there were at least five individuals that were minors, okay? So they allege that there were children at this party at the age of 16. It is alleged by Rodney Jones that Sean P. Diddy Combs forced all the women and the girls at this party to drink laced Deleon liquor. Upon information and belief that Mr. Combs laced the liquor with ecstasy. In focus of the underaged females at this party, the children, the girls, it says in this lawsuit that none of the staff or P. Diddy himself checked the uh, identification of these girls and Mr. Jones feeling you know, uncomfortable, tried to leave the party, but he was forced to stay. Rodney Jones, AKA Lil Rod, then alleges that after being forced to take laced Deleon liquor, he remembers feeling lightheaded and then blacking out and waking up in a bed with sex workers. In the next section of the lawsuit, there is an allegation that Sean P. Diddy Combs tried to groom and pass off Rodney Jones to actor Cuba Gooding Jr. It says here that there was a fear that became a reality when P. Diddy introduced Rodney Jones to Cuba Gooding Jr. while they were on his yacht. During the introduction, P. Diddy suggested that Cuba Gooding Jr. would get to know Mr. Jones a lot better when he then left them alone in a makeshift studio on the yacht. Rodney Jones then alleges that uh, as evidenced by the video, by a video of which screenshots are shown right in front of you, Cuba Gooding Jr. began touching, groping, and fondling Mr. Jones's legs, his upper inner thighs near his groin, and the small of his back near his buttocks and his shoulders. Lil Rod, AKA Rodney Jones, or the other way around, was extremely uncomfortable he tried to lean away from Cuba Gooding Jr. He rejected all of his advances and Cuba Gooding Jr. did not stop until Rodney Jones forcibly pushed him away. The following is a, a screenshot right in front of you of this type of encounter with Cuba Gooding Jr. In 
the next section of the lawsuit, it is alleged that Rodney Jones was not compensated for his time producing the Love album with Sean P. Diddy Combs. It says that although he was living with P. Diddy, he wasn't compensated for his production time. Not only did this production benefit P. Diddy, but also the recording studios that were associated with this album. There were many royalties that Rodney Jones was promised. And when those royalties did not manifest into reality, uh, it says here that Rodney Jones was left with no other option but to take on to social media to plead for P. Diddy to pay him for what is right. After making that public plea and outcry for P. Diddy to pay him what it is worth, he states that he got threatening messages from Stevie J and Love Records and our DeForest Taylor. The next section exhibits or alleges that P. Diddy has uh, overexerted his influence and power to intimidate Rodney Jones. So according to Rodney Jones, he is uh, he as in P. Diddy is very forceful and demeaning and demanding uh, that he does not take no for an answer and would often threaten to bodily injure or inflict bodily harm on Rodney Jones if he didn't do what he wanted him to do. And with those details said, it also says in this lawsuit that P. Diddy threatened to eat Rodney Jones's face. In another intimidating scene, it says here that Rodney Jones was in P. Diddy's bedroom where Mr. Jones, Rodney Jones, AKA Lil Rod was forced to watch as Mr. Combs uh, displayed his guns and bragged about getting away with shooting people. Uh, P. Diddy shared that he was responsible for the shooting of a nightclub in New York City with rapper Shine. He also shared that P. Diddy's girlfriend at the time, who was J-Lo, actually carried a gun into the club for him and passed him the gun after he got into an altercation with another individual. So all of these events compounded of P. Diddy utilizing uh, these shooting scenes and being responsible for the shootings allegedly, but then getting away with it was an intimidation factor over Rodney Jones. In fact, P. Diddy made it very clear that his head of security Fahin Muhammad, or Mr. Muhammad as he's known as, had the power to make people and problems disappear. Allegedly, this Mr. Muhammad had many ties in LAPD and, you know, law enforcement. And so he allegedly leveraged that connection and power to make problems go away. Here's an example that is included with the lawsuit. For example, the LAPD spent hours in the Shallis recording studio after the shooting of Mr. G. We went over that in video one. Yet there were no arrests and Rodney Jones witnessed the LAPD in the restroom pictured uh, right in front of you, yet nobody was arrested. Next part of the lawsuit alleges that defendants Ethiopia, Hab Tamariam, Lucian, Charles Grange, Motown Records, Love Records, and Universal Music Group aided, abetted, and profited off of Sean Combs Rico Enterprise. It says here that Rodney Jones recalls Lucian Grange visiting P. Diddy's home in Miami, Florida and Los Angeles, California. And as he would visit these homes that he would disappear for hours on end with P. Diddy in a bedroom. Lucian Grange sponsored and attended many of the several love album listening parties at Mr. P. Diddy's home in Los Angeles, that the parties were sponsored. And this is kind of where the connections start, um, you know, manifesting itself between the industry and the, you know, nefarious activities that go on, because it says here that the parties were sponsored by defendants. Motown Records, Love Records, and Universal Music Group, meaning that these parties that had the sex workers and the underage girls at the parties that were given illegal things and being told to do illegal things, influenced to do illegal things, uh, were actually sponsored by these record companies. That's what it says in the lawsuit. So Rodney is alleging that Lucian Grange would know or should have known that P. Diddy was drugging the attendees through the laced bottles of Deleon tequila and Ciroc vodka. It was also an open secret that P. Diddy had specific bottles of alcohol designated for females and for other bottles designated for her staff, his artists, and himself. 
This fact was detailed by a former artist and bodyguards of Mr. Combs. So as a sponsor to these events, Lucian Grange had a duty to and an obligation to ensure that sex workers and underage girls were not present and that P. Diddy was not spiking the alcohol with date rape drugs. On YouTube channel Art of the Dialogue, former bodyguard Gene Deal exposed P. Diddy pill mixing methods used to spike cranberry juice and orange juice. According to Gene Deal, P. Diddy would place ecstasy and other date rape drugs in the juices. Like I said, anything that has to do with those sexual assaults, those people have to prove that. But is it, are they capable? Yeah, they're capable. Look at the atmosphere. They're in the music industry. They're in the music business. They set up those type of, uh, uh, they, they learn the tricks of the trade. For instance, guys don't put those pills that they get to the girls in the champagne bottles because they popping them in front of them. Most of those girls, especially if they like mixed drinks, you understand, they see the bottles when they open them and they trying to keep their eyes on because they don't want to get no kind of drugs put in their system. But what they don't understand is in the orange juice and it's in the cranberry juice. They didn't put the pills and the stuff in there, the roofies, the ecstasy, the ease, all whatever they, they put it in the juice. Now, those girls who like the mixed drinks, you understand what I'm saying? They gonna pour their own sexual act because they don't understand it ain't in the bottles, it's in the juice. Those guys, they learn that and they put it to those girls who don't know no better. On the same YouTube channel, Art of the Dialogue, former artist Mark Curry exposed P. Diddy spiking bottles of Moe champagne in the VIP section of the nightclubs and that P. Diddy would have a set of Moe champagne bottles for his artists and another set for the women. We got to rewind this back. We used to go to the, when we go to the club, we used to have these bottles, right? And on this bottle, they'd be, they'd be regular Moe bottles. On them bottles right there, they've been to have something to make the girls be real, real slippery and all of this kind of stuff. So when you get up, they'd be like, don't touch them bottles right there and only drink them bottles right there. So we already knew what the drill was. You just don't mess with them bottles, right? Then all of the girls is in the club after a while. They all running, look, opening up their mouth like little birds. He's running around just popping pills in their mouth. Pop, pill, 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 pill. And then that was the party. But all of the females that was in it, that's what they wanted. That was what part of it. it was part of the hip hop culture. We ain't seen nothing wrong with it until Bill Cosby got in trouble. So this writer then alleges that, spoken with several former employees uh, of P. Diddy, that his head of staff, Christina Corum, instructed her staff to lace the champagne, Delion, and Ciroc liquor bottles with ecstasy and other illicit drugs. So then Rodney goes into detail in the lawsuit that Ethiopia Haptimerium, Haptimerium, I believe, yes, uh, that she v visited P. Diddy in his home and that she would disappear for hours in his bedroom. And as a duty as a sponsor, Rodney Jones alleges that Ethiopia Haptonarium should have known about P. Diddy spiking these liquor bottles and that she had a duty and an obligation to prevent uh, sex workers and girls to not be present at these parties. And here's the big one. Christina Corum, who I mentioned a little bit earlier, as well as in my former video, uh, is being compared to Glenn Maxwell. That was Jeffrey Epstein's right-hand woman, his ex-lover, and Madame, right? So according to the lawsuit, Rodney Jones, during the 13 months he lived and traveled with Sean P. Diddy Combs, uh, he witnessed P. Diddy display and distribute guns from his bedroom closet in Miami, Florida, and Los Angeles, California, to questionable individuals dressed in all black. Uh, according to 
Rodney Jones, during the 13 months he lived and traveled with P. Diddy, he witnessed Christina Corum, the chief of staff, openly order her assistants to keep P. Diddy high off of gummies and pills. Christina Corum required, allegedly required all employees from the butler to the chef to the housekeepers to walk around with a pouch or a fanny pack filled with cocaine, GHB, ecstasy, marijuana gummies, um, and Tucci, a pink drug that is a combination of ecstasy and cocaine. I think it's Tucci, T-U-C-I. You guys can correct me if not. It was important for Christina Corum to provide P. Diddy with any drug of his choice at any given point of time. It also alleges that Christina Corum ordered sex workers and prostitutes for P. Diddy, and also uh, that she ordered and distributed the illicit drugs that I named. It says here that Christina Christina Corum not only ordered and distributed these drugs, but also or, uh, distributed them on his yacht to celebrities and his elite clients. Now, this is where Rodney Jones comes in because he alleges that there were several occasions that Christina Corum would force him to carry these illicit drugs against his will. So he alleges that as the chief of staff, Christina Corum was actually organizing and executing a RICO enterprise. Christina Corum allegedly had the following individuals execute the following tasks for the RICO enterprise. Stevie J would recruit sex workers and attend and participate in the freak offs. You guys don't know what the freak offs are. I might just make a separate video and what a freak off is. You know, it was in my Cassie Ventura video when we went through some of the details, but these are basically these high elite parties that are exactly what you think. So anyway, freak offs. Justin Combs would solicit prostitutes, underage girls, and sex workers, and would engage in freak offs. Brendan Paul would work as P. Diddy's mule. He would acquire and distribute P. Diddy's drugs and guns. Frank sent. Taya worked alongside, allegedly worked alongside Brendan while Brendan acquired and distributed P. Diddy's drugs and guns. Frankie carried the money and paid for the guns and drugs, allegedly. Moy Bon. Uh, is allegedly responsible for hiring sex workers, attending and participating in freak offs. This is where there is a certain allegation that seems to be that P. Diddy himself is the head of an operation to blackmail because it says here in this particular section of the lawsuit that Mr. Combs is allowed to wreak havoc. While living and traveling with P. Diddy, Rodney Jones discovered that P. Diddy had hidden cameras in every room of his houses. Now, this is also an allegation against Jeffrey Epstein, so that's where a lot of people are drawing these comparisons and similar similarities between Jeffrey Epstein and P. Diddy. Rodney Jones has a belief that P. Diddy has recordings of Lucian Charles Grange, Ethiopia Habtermarium, and others, uh, other celebrities, music label executives, politicians, and athletes. It says here that it is alleged that P. Diddy possesses compromising footage of every person that has attended his freak off parties and his house parties. It is alleged that upon the information and belief due to the treasure trove of evidence he has in his possession, P. Diddy believes that he is above the law and untouchable. And upon the information and belief that P. Diddy employs Jose Cruz as his IT director, this writer has spoken to several former employees of P. Diddy who confirmed that Jose Cruz is a gatekeeper to all of Mr. Com's recordings. Upon the information and belief, Jose Cruz allegedly intentionally hides behind the camera and from social media and the internet due to all of the incriminating acts he was required to record for P. Diddy. So I know that that was a lot, but I definitely wanted to just give you guys a rundown of the lawsuit, illustrate it out for you. But there are some definite things that I wanna do deeper dives on that come out of this lawsuit. There are people that I want to research, but I definitely wanted to just run it down and then I will do the deep dive later. But with that being said, guys, um, this was definitely a lot. And for me, especially as a conspiracy realist, um, you know, it definitely does give me uh, some sort of closure and clarity that what we think goes on and what is uh, uh, contextually 
illustrative that goes on in Hollywood is not far-fetched from the mind because there is now credible evidence and uh, credible witness statements that would allege that these things do go on. So let's see what this brings about. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below. I will be taking another gander at this lawsuit. There are some definite pinpoints that I want to expand on and elaborate on. So if you're new to this channel, be sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel. There's definitely more content surrounding this type of subject. With that said, thank you guys so much for your love and your support. I will catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.